welcome everybody. Thank you so much for all coming again to my third talk here in Daenera, which has been such a roaring success. Not me, I meant Daenera itself. Um, and again, congratulations to all those organising it and doing everything with it because it really has been an amazing platform. I think you'll all agree. But a year after the opening in Munich of the exhibition Antartet Kunst Degenerate Art in 1937, the cultural politicians of the Nazi regime put on another much less well-known show. This exhibition was entitled Antartet Musik and was staged in Dusseldorf in 1938. But what was this term degenerate and what did it mean? The scientific term degenerate was, an ad uh, was adapted by the Nazis to defame atonal music, jazz arrangements, modernism, and above all, works by Jewish composers. The concept of degeneracy became fixed to a new norm, namely the ideal of a music based on racial origin. Degenerates, who were performers, composers, and mu musicologists, teachers, were forced to emigrate or were killed, causing a serious drain of talent on European musical life, the consequences of which have scarcely been recognized or appreciated even today. Music was not simply just another art form in the Third Reich. In the Nazi imagination, music had a unique significance and power. As a nation, Germany had a long tradition of musical success with Germans disproportionately represented among the great classical composers. There was Mozart, who was Austrian, but also Bach, Beethoven, Haydn, Schubert and Wagner, leading some to claim that music was the most German of all the arts. The internationally acknowledged importance of German composers, conductors and musicians was an enormous sense of pride. While for the Nazis, the purported degeneration of German music was both a metaphor and a symptom of the degeneration of the nation. But the process of redefining German music by the Nazis didn't start with this exhibition or in January 1933 with Hitler's ascendancy to the post of Chancellor. If we look at, back at the build-up of this anti-Semitism, we see Richard Wagner who wrote his vitriolic essay, Juda Judaism in Music, linking the forces of European anti-Semitism with the idea of the Jewish perniciousness in world music. Printed twice, once in 1850 under a pseudonym, the second in 1861 under his, no, both his own name. In both, he slandered Meyer and Mendelssohn, although he and his family had converted in 1816, as well as other Jewish composers. These articles were incorporated decades later in the Third Reich by the Education Ministry as gospel. Wagner said, we observe in Jewish music works that soulless, feelingless inertia. What issues from the Jews attempts at making art must necessarily therefore bear the attributes of coldness and indifference, even to triviality and absurdity. And in the history of modern music, we can but class the Judaic period as that of a final unproductivity and of stability gone to ruin. Then, in the 19th, as the 19th century moved on, Jews more easily participated in German life by religious inclusion, conversion, assimilation and intermarriage. They began to become racially camouflaged and many began to think Jews would eventually undermine German identity and its innate moral character. Jews, often referred to as Orientals or Israelis, were considered rootless, having no permanent anchor or homeland, and as such were forced to absorb all kinds of local influences, becoming a conglomerate of appropriated qualities. Mendelssohn's music was thus consequently inauthentic.
before World War I, we see blatant acts of anti-Semitism, with the famous composer and conductor Gustav Mahler being forced out of musical life in Vienna in 1907 against the clamour of anti-Semitic statements, although he also converted. Interestingly, Mahler is considered the first Jewish composer to start pushing musical boundaries and write music which was creative, creatively confrontationalist. <laughs> in Vienna pre-World War I, there was the expressionistic apocalyptic world works of Schoenberg, who converted to Austrian Lutheranism at 23. His importance in music has been compared to that of Albert Einstein's in physics. In physics. Schoenberg's renunciation of tonality and the major minor scale system and his invention of the 12 tone system has been established as the most important revolution in 20th century music. He said to his students, Today I have discovered something that will assure the supremacy of German music for the next hundred years. As Mahler shook the brown boundaries, Schoenberg broke them down. Austrian and German empires in 1919, many of Vienna's principal Jewish composers moved to Berlin where they shaped an emerging avant-garde. 
the Weimar period. They became participants in a new media movement of cinema and broadcast, having a quirky view of society, making them naturals as writers and composers of parody, satire, cabaret, review, operettas and trendy operas, offering props with radios and jazz bands and flappers and police sirens, but always towards purely mechanical, robotic and unemotional music. Culturally, the Weimar period is frequently cited as having one of the highest levels of intellectual productivity in human history. Germany was the country with the most advances in science, technology, literature, philosophy and the arts. And in the 1920s, Berlin was at the hectic centre of the Weimar culture. There are important achievements by Jews in theatre with Max Reinhardt, in music with Arnold Schoenberg, in the visual arts with Max Liebermann, in philosophy with Herman Cohen, and in science with Albert Einstein. Among the Nobel Prize winners in Germany up to 1938, 24% were Jews, nine Jews out of a total of 38. To many in this period, Judaism changed from a religious religion to a new tradition of German Jewish culture in the realms of Jewish scholarship, education, literature, music, and the arts. With this unprecedented integration of Jews into every sphere of life was, of course, the growth of political anti-Semitism. In the Weimar people period, people experienced a huge sense of freedom, of decadence, of new ideas which were, which were explored, and everything was on offer. Musically, there was no dominant trend. Composers were all trying to explore new ways out of the world of the late Romantic period. They wanted to say something that was shocking, extraordinary and true, and often used noises of the city like the trains and alarms and bells to convey their messages with composers like Schoenberg, Weil and Brecht, Hindemith and Stravinsky, all working side by side. Europe in the Roaring Twenties, unashamedly exuberant after the horrors of the First World War, high on a cocktail of discovery and innovation. Art, music, literature, philosophy, politics, all were inextricably bound in the energetic surge that within a short space of time founded the diverse movements of Expressionism and Cubism and gave birth to Dada, Objectivity and Futurism. The sense of freedom was all pervasive physical, the creative atmosphere groundbreaking, intellectual, broad-minded, decadent. New influences were readily embraced and explored. A heavy traffic of ideas and creativity crisscrossed the continents, challenging the boundaries of convention. The opera Johnny Spilt Auf was written, which means Johnny Strikes Up, was written by the Catholic composer Krennic. His contemporary jazzy opera about a black man was hugely successful in the Weimar. There were 421 performances in one season alone, breaking all records, and it was one of the first operas criticised by the Nazis.
like the comedian harmonics who were like the backstreet boys of their day. They were the internationally famous all male German close harmony ensemble that performed between 1928 and 1934. Their repertoire ranged from folk and classical song arrangements to witty popular songs of the day. As three of their group were Jewish or of Jewish descent, they eventually ran into trouble with the Nazi regime disbanding in 1934. And although all of them survived the war, they never re re, um, reformed after the war. was actually them getting back together again um, in the last, I don't know, 20 odd years. And so there were those flashes of their old self and their new self in, to, um, together. But not everybody was happy with the new ideas of the Weimar. Many conservative nationalists saw the new musical trends of this period as an omen of, gen, of global degeneration. It was Germany's defeat at World War I, the economic devastation that followed and the humiliation of the Treaty of Versailles that brought the situation to a head. For many, the increased popularity of swing, jazz, avant-garde experimentation of African-American and Jewish musicians was not just a coincidence. They were both cause and effect of the general collapse of German society and German values. This degenerate music was seen as profit and thrill driven, superficial, lacking in originality because its participants were lacking their own healthy nation and culture due to their assumed foreignness and their link with an undesirable and destructive modernity. In March 1933, when the Nazis took over Germany, Jews were dominating music more than virtually any other sector, making it the most important cultural front in the Nazi fight for German identity. The party's policies on music brought about a cultural holocaust with far-reaching consequences for the history and development of, of music during the 20th century. Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the new Minister of Propaganda, was intent con on controlling every aspect of the German mindset and immediately took control of all new German newspapers and radio, summarily firing all the art and music critics who did not support his aesthetic agenda. He developed a four-point plan to expunge any and every facet of the Jewish presence in German music. The first point called for the removal of all Jews from official musical posts with the proclamation of the law of the restoration of the professional civil services on the 7th of April, 1933. This decree led to the widespread dismissal of Jewish conductors, singers, music teachers, and administrators from tenured positions. In a short time, the world witnessed the exit of two of the leading conductors from Germany, Otto Klemperer and Bruno Walter. The composers Arnold Schoenberg and Franz Schrecker were forced to resign from their teaching positions from the illustrious Prussian Academy of Art. Schoenberg went to America, reconverting to Judaism, and Schrecker died through harassment and intimidation, making him the first Jewish musical casualty of the Nazi era. Kurt Weill, Paul Hindemith, um, Berthold Goldschmidt, and Ergon Veles left for England or the USA before being exiled. World-renowned violinists Yehudi Menuhin and Yasha Heifetz were prohibited from playing in Germany. This span also included semi-private and private institutions. 
Winifred Wagner sacked all her Jewish musicians in the 1933 season at Beirut. Kurt Weil said, I consider what's going on here so sickening that I cannot imagine it lasting for more than a couple of months, but one could be very wrong. The second point banned the performance of all music written by Jewish composers of Jewish blood, conversion being of no consequence. Even the Silence Woman by Richard Strauss was banned after a few performances because of the composer's librettist was the Jewish Stefan Weig. The fact that a thoroughbred of German music was being so publicly humiliated shows the extent that Goebbels was prepared for her to go at this early stage. was to get intellectual backing for his practical policies. Eminent musicologists wrote complete books with misleading information about the negative aspects of the Jewish presence in German music. Respected acad acad academics like Eisenhower and Blessinger contributed to the climate of acceptance of the very visible changes occurring in the concert halls in Germany. Goebbels' fourth direction was an attack on the influence of Jewish music the world over. Tremendous effort was invested in two publications which collected as much information as possible about Jewish musicians and compositions from around the world. The first was entitled Unter Judaism in der Musik, ABC, and was published as early as 1935, while the bigger and more comprehensive lexicon of Jews in music was published in the second year of the war, 1940. This date symbolically indicates how important it was for the Nazis to engage in a cultural war at the same time as a world war. Their obsessiveness shows in their revision of major musical classics by composers such as Mozart and Handel. Mozart's polluted The Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni had a new German version prepared, so the original Italian libretto by De Ponte, a converted Jew, could be forgotten. Furthermore, Handel's oratorios oratorio Judas Maccabeus disappeared from the musical world, reappearing as the field marshal, a war drama, a necessary change of name to secure German cultural purity. The musicologist Blessinger said, music is an important political matter of tremendous world importance with which we are involved at this very moment. That is the reason why the wrestling of the final recovery of German music extends far beyond the artistic and the cultural areas. Wir haben ein deutsches Theater, einen deutschen Film, eine deutsche Presse, ein deutsches Schrifttum, eine deutsche bildende Kunst, eine deutsche Musik und einen deutschen Rundfunk. Der früher oft gegen uns vorgebrachte Einwand, es gäbe keine Möglichkeit, die Juden aus dem Kunst- und Kulturleben zu beseitigen, weil deren zu viele seien und wir die leeren Plätze nicht neu besetzen könnten, ist glänzend widerlegt worden. 
The Nazis envisioned themselves as a mass, mass nationalist movement, with me, music being seen as the great crowd pleaser and the most effective way to seduce and sway the masses. Goebbels said, music affects the heart and the emotion more than the intellect. When there could the heart of a nation beat stronger than in the huge masses in which the heart of a nation has found its, its pure home? The Nazi quest to purify the German music from degeneracy and return it to the mythical Germanness motivated an enormous amount of planning, activity and policymaking. Nazi sponsored newspapers took particular glee at slandering the names and careers of degenerate musicians, often threatening violence in retaliation for any German. The rapidity with which these developments took place stunned Jews living in Germany with very little protest from non-Jews, some of whom leapt at the opportunity to fill newly vacant positions. The only major German figure to offer any sort of public protest was the conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler, who wrote an open letter to Goebbels in which he approved of the elimination of the Jewish influence over the German music, but he insisted that there were brilliant individual Jews who should be allowed to continue performing. He was worried about how he was going to fill the positions in his own orchestra. George Hensel, who wrote the music for Goebbels' opera Baron Munchausen, said he could notice that the Jewish musicians were vanishing because the violin sections were getting thinner and thinner. There were both official and unofficial ways of getting rid of Jewish musicians. Unofficially, there was harassment and beating, and almost immediately in January 1933, Nazi supporters formed the Combat League of German Culture, which began to disrupt musical performances and Jewish artists. As music in Germany was largely financed by federal and state cultural budgets, thousands of Jewish musicians suddenly found themselves out of work. There was also a large number of foreign itinerant musicians, mainly Poles and Hungarians, who played in the, hol on the, hotels, ho the hotel salon orchestras in summer and would then go to Holland and France in the winter and then would return the following summer, all of whom lost their jobs. In 1933, the Kulturbund Juden, the Cultural Federation of German Jews, was created with a registered Jewish membership of 180,000. Renamed in 1935 by the, the Nazi authorities to the Jewish Cultural Federation, or Kubu. It existed for five years and was created by unemployed Jewish performers at the consent of the Nazis for the Jewish population with its headquarters in Berlin. The Kulturbund was one of the most famous examples of Jewish creativity in response to cultural exclusionism. It provided an assemblance of leisure for its members in 49 different locales throughout Germany. The first performance in Berlin on the 1st of October 1933 was of Lessing's Nathan the Wise, ironically about Jews, Muslims and Christians living together in harmony in Jerusalem during the Crusades. <laughs> on theatrical performances, concerts, exhibitions, operas and lectures all over Germany, performed by Jewish entertainers, artists, writers and scientists who were no longer permitted by the Nazi party to appear before German audiences. Jewish performers could now again earn a living, no matter how scarce, taking place in authorised segregated venues with Jewish only attendance. 
Ironically, the couple produced what amounted to the best theatre, cabaret, concerts, operas, conferences, operettas, chamber music, folk songs and light music entertainment. Sigmund Petrushka, a swing trumpeter and leader of the Sid K Fellows, even cut a few records on the league's own Lucrophon label. <laughs> musicians from abroad to perform in Berlin, including Alexander Kipnitz from the Berlin Opera, who left for the USA in 1933 and came back in 1934 and 1938, and Sabine Cater from the Hamburg Opera, who went to Covent Garden in 1937 and came, came back to sing in both Hamburg and in Berlin. Monies made from these concerts and from the publishing department was transferred to the Central Office of Jewish Emigration and paid emigration fees levied on the lucky receivers of foreign visas who were too poor to pay for them. On September the 11th, 1941, the Gestapo ordered the closure of the Kulturbund. Critics and some former members have argued that the involvement in the League distracted its Jewish members from the Nazi dangers and the very changing realities of the situation for Jews in Germany. Performers after the disbandment who had not already left had to either stay in Germany and die or try at this very late stage to emigrate. On the 13th of March, 1938, the Germans invaded, invasion of Austria or the Anschluss began. Jewish members of Austria's Society of Authors, Composers and Music Publishers, known as the AKM, were blacklisted. In 2010, found among the printed works of the Vienna City Library was catalogue A91394. It was the 1937 AKM membership directory. Bold red lines had been neatly hand-drawn through the names of the Jewish AKM members. After Austria's incorporation into the Reich, its cultural institutions rapidly implemented anti-Semitic policies and the AKM was placed under the control of the German Performing Arts Society under the direction of Joseph Goebbels and the Ministry of Propaganda. Jews were now banned from membership. Bella Bartok, a member of the AKM, wrote from Budapest on the 13th of April 1938 regarding the changing situations in Austria and he said, as regard my own affairs, I must say that things are not very good at the moment, because not only has my publishing house, the UE, gone Nazi, the proprietors and the directors were simply turned out, but also the AKM, the Viennese Society for Performing Arts, to which I belong, and Kodai also, has also been Nazified. Only the day before yesterday, I received a notorious questionnaire about grandfathers, etc. Then, are you of German blood, of kindred race, or non-Aryan? Naturally, neither I nor could I will fill in this form. Our opinion is that such questions are wrong and illegal. We must insist on having nothing to do with this unlawful questionnaire, which therefore must remain unanswered. According to one estimate, those persecuted by the AKM constituted approximately 42% of the membership. And here are some of those pages. with the Jewish artists and composers having their names crossed out. The wave of anti-Jewish violence unleashed by the Anschluss caused repercussions in the Austrian musical world, not only because of the changing makeup of the orchestra, but also because of the diminishment, diminishing numbers with the audience. 
The Nazis reported as early as 1938-39 that they were having financial problems because the audiences were being so negatively affected by their own persecution policies. By the early 20th century, one third of all students in conservatoires and more than half all audiences were made up of Jews in Vienna. The Degenerate Music Exhibition opened on the 24th of May, 1938 in Dusseldorf. It aimed to galvanize public hatred of music deemed un-German by the Nazis as part of a week celebrating national music. Everything that was to have no place in the Nazi musical culture was presented. The vilified genres included popular music, operettas, atonalism, but especially music by Jewish composers, as well as jazz, dismissed as, and I'm sorry for the word, nigger music. The visual component of the exhibition consisted of photographs, portraits, paintings, caricatures, and posters intended to illustrate the subhuman character of the featured musicians and the inferiority of their work. The exhibition's curator was Hans Siveris Ziegler, the superintendent of the Weimar National Theatre, and he said at the opening of the show, what has been collected in this exhibition represents an effigy of wickedness, an effigy of arrogant Jewish imprudence and complete spiritual insip insipidness. He also explained that the decay of music was due to the influence of Judaism and capitalism. The word Jewish, degenerate and Bolshevik were commonly used to describe any art or music not acceptable to the Third Reich. The title page of the exhibition's brochure made Ziegler's intentions immediately clear. It was a caricature depicting Johnny, the black jazz music, musician from Ernst Krenick's opera, Johnny Spielt Auf, which we heard before. But now Johnny has been mutated to look like a monkey, wearing a star of David rather than a carnation in his buttonhole. It would become a prominent symbol within Nazi propaganda and the symbol of degenerate music. Sound booths allowed listeners to hear firsthand the corrosive powers of jazz and swing music. Once celebrated Jew Jewish operetta composers like Emmerich Kalman, Leo Fowl, Paul Abraham and, and Leon Jessler, as well as star singers like Richard Tauber, were pictured with obscured faces and deemed uh, mentally ill. These are other pages from the program. Displays offering polemics against Arnold Schoenberg and his followers, whose atonal music was said to have mocked classical masterpieces and flouted hallowed traditions. Paul Hindemith, who wasn't Jewish, was also condemned as a theoretician of atonality. Ziegler's exhibition was organized into seven sections, devoted to one, the influence of Judaism, two, Schoenberg, three, Kurt Weill and Ernst Krenick, four, the minor Bolsheviks being Schrecker, Berg and Toch, etc. 
the fifth Leo Kresenberg, who'd been the director of musical education before 1933, Hindemith's operas and oratorios, and seven, Igor Stravinsky. Famous works by Mendelssohn and Mahler were also used as examples of unacceptable music. Other degenerate composers included Goldschmidt, Klemperer, Krongold, Volta, Webern, and Berg, both Jews and non-Jews. Among the, rep the repertoire vilified was Friedrich Hollander's Falling in Love Again, I Can't Help It, Berg's um, Vosek, Brecht and Weil's Flippany Opera, and Krongold's brilliant Wunder der Helian. considered the label Degenerate Music as a title which would do him honour. And in 1938, he courageously demanded that the Nazi government should include his own compositions in the Dusseldorf exhibition. The aim of the exhibition was to teach Germans how to recognise destructive musical influences and drive them out of the new state. Instead, many of those attendees actually enjoyed listening to the music that was under fire. Other prominent objects of vilification in the exhibition was jazz, but the attacks did little to alter its fate in, in Nazi Germany. Jazz had started out as an easy target symbolizing foreign corruption in the minds of the conservative music critics and by practicing musicians who feared composition, competition from the influx of foreign jazz musicians. Ironically though, the Germans appreciated the sophistication of jazz during the 1930s and its popularity spiked during the war. Soldiers and the German public threatened to tune into foreign broadcasts if German radio refused to offer it on their own um, radio waves. But not everybody was happy with this exhibition. Peter Raab, was, who was then the president of the all-encompassing National Musical Union, tendered his resignation in response to the exhibit. His predecessor, Richard Strauss, the godfather of German music, expressed his dismay more subtly, whereas other prominent musicians simply shunned the event. The event. To such an extent, the Goebbels shut down the exhi exhibition prematurely. The degenerate music exhibition, with its barrage of anti-Semitic rhetoric, was just one more factor that contributed to the German public's acceptance of the assault of the rights, property, and physical safety of its Jewish citizens. The attacks, the exhibit's attacks on so broad a spectrum of musical tastes only increased the vindictiveness in an atmosphere rife for renunciation and betrayal. The contributions the Jewish composers and musicians made to Germany prior to World War II were ultimately very real and lasting. To state the Jewish cultural input was delusional would chalk up a victory to Hitler. But how much wonderful music have we lost? 
not only because of the destruction of precious manuscripts when the Nazis came to power, but also by the enforced exile of so many Jewish, German Jewish musicians whose musical output was either not recognized in their own new homeland, or they were unable to find the strength to compose like so many of the composers who fled to England, or they had to completely change their writing skills to earn a living, like those who went to America. Their legacy was spread across the globe and left unconsolidated and unrecognized, not to mention all the works which were never written by composers whose lives were cut so short. In recent years, Decca Music Label began the Antantet Music series, which has brought back to life more than 30 forgotten key works from the first half of the century by composers persecuted or killed in the war. Unlike a painting which is there to be seen, if music isn't played, it is easily forgotten. And thankfully, these works are now part of the modern repertoire. to either definitively know how much music was lost or imagine what the musical scene would have been like if the Holocaust had never happened. But like Decker, I think it's time we resurrected some of this forgotten degenerate music. Thank you very much. And I would now like to unmute you all, if I can, I can. And then I know there are a lot of you, so it's gonna be hard, but, oh, that didn't unmute. Let me try that again. Yeah, it's worth Oh, are you unmuted? Some yeah. of you are. Yeah. Oh, good. Now, yes, if can you hear me? Like, yes, if anyone would like to ask any questions, I know there are a lot of you, and I'm actually going to get out of this. The, oh, there, I can see many more of them. Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Any questions? <laughs> no questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> How does Germany uh, relate to? Goldberg. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. say that again, John. How does Germany handle all uh, that it did today in regard to the musical world of Germany today? Yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, I think it is very understanding of what happened and is very keen to. Mm, I don't want to say make amends because that's so silly, but um, try and rectify the musical situation by promoting much more of this, this degenerate music. And, and they are much, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, yeah, did somebody else want to ask a question? Well, you're also quiet. There's so many of you. Surely somebody has a question they can ask me. I'd like to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, what was the name of the Decca collection of that lost? It's degenerate music, Antitect music. Okay. And very interestingly, also, just as a total aside, I found out a couple of years ago that my family actually started Decca. So, <laughs> <laughs> in England, yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah. No? No? Well, thank you very, very much. I hope you, um, I'm not going to say enjoyed because it is a hard topic to enjoy, um, but um, I hope I opened the door a bit to you about this music. This degenerate music really is forgotten. It's um, not just in the in the, the Jewish concept of, of music, but the whole, because of what happened after it, we sort of forget about the Weimar period and the excitement of music that was happening during the Weimar period. And then I think we are also overcome with the, the lead up to the war that we sort of forget sometimes about 
what was happening on the cultural side, as well as what was happening to, to individual Jewish people throughout this build up to the war. Next, in two weeks time, we are um, having another one um, looking at, and this is a, a hard topic, it's looking at music in, um, in the camps, the music during the Holocaust, um, and the music that was written um, both by the Jewish people for the Jewish people, and also the music <laughs> that was written by the Jewish people for the Nazis. So that will be the topic in two weeks time. I hope to see you there. I, um, it, it, is, I, 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 it is a hard topic. I, I, um, I sort of warn you, now, but I think again, like this one, that these are topics that really need to be to be known and um, communicated to not only us but to the wider community as well. So thank you very, very much. Um, I hope you have a, a terrific day and a terrific couple of weeks. And um, if you want to ask questions or, or anything, please don't hesitate to email me. You can email me personally, that's absolutely fine. And I hope we'll, I'll be able to um, let you know.